I'm Joe Bev, and this is The Joe Bev Show. On this edition of The Joe Bev Show, Uncle Dunkel in A Little Bird Told Me, Part 3, The Conclusion of Laurel and Hardy in For the Freedom of the World, and yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in The Exposé Matter. That's coming up on The Joe Bev Show. Uh, Johnny? Huh? When somebody asks you where you got some important piece of information, have you ever said, a little bird told me? Well, why would I say that? Yeah, I just wondered. You see, sometimes people say that when they don't want to divulge where that important piece of information came from. Divulge? Hmm. What does divulge mean? It means tell. Well, then why didn't you say tell? It means the same thing as divulge. Yeah, but I know what tell means. But I don't know what divulge means. Uh, well, you, <laughs> you know now. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I got you. <laughs> I guess you did. That's a pretty sneaky way of teaching me a new word. Yeah, it's, a, it's a thing Uncle Dunkles do. You gotta watch out for us. You mean there's more than one Uncle Dunkle? Yeah, there must be. I couldn't stand the responsibility of being the only one. <laughs> well, you're doing all right so far. And what were you talking about before? About a bird? I was saying that when a person says, a little bird told me, it's because they don't want to divulge where the information actually came from. They're telling a fib, right? Uh, sort of. They are. Well, they, they are sort of. I'm really getting more involved in this than I meant to be. What I wanted to tell you about was not what a little bird told me, but what I told a little bird. Was it a fib? No, it was a sparrow. <laughs> and this sparrow did a very noble thing, performed a valuable service. He did it for a friend of mine, this man who retired from his job. He'd worked hard all his life, and now he figured he'd earned the right to take it easy. His name was Herman Ha Ha. Oh, that's a funny name. Uh, yeah, sort of. We were talking one day, Herman Ha Ha and me, and uh, Herman said, D'Artagnan, I am sore perplexed. I never had a hobby. I just worked. I never learned to play golf or tennis or chess. Or even tiddlywinks. I did read the rules on tiddlywinks, uh, but, uh, well, I never uh, got around to actually playing it. You missed out on a lot of fun. I was a West Coast contender. Well, now that I'm older and retired and I've grown quite plump. You're fat. Well, I said plump. Well, plump means fat. Yes, but it, well, it doesn't sound as fat as fat. Well, uh, being quite plump... My doctor doesn't want me to involve myself in any activity which is too strenuous. So I've decided to become a bird watcher, even though I am nearsighted. Well, Donnie, once Herman Ha Ha made up his mind to do something, nothing could change him. I tried to talk him out of the bird watching idea, but, uh, well, not because of his eyes. Why? Bad timing. See, Winter was coming on, and all the birds had flown south for the warm weather. All the birds, that is, but the sparrow. Your friend? You're more of an acquaintance, actually. You see, the sparrow sticks out the winter with the rest of us. So, knowing that my friend Herman... Ha-ha. Uh huh? Ha-ha. Uh -huh. uh, what's so funny? I was just remembering Herman's last name. Ha ha! It wasn't any laughing matter. Herman ha ha expecting to go out bird watching when there wouldn't be any birds. Well, except sparrows. So, so what I did, I called on this sparrow acquaintance of mine, in name of Billingsley. He was way up on top of an elm tree in his nest and couldn't hear me yelling at him. So what I did, I, uh, I had your aunt Rapunzel shinny up the tree and tap him on the head. Ah, oh, she did not. Uh, well, that's right. Uh, she didn't. <laughs> of course she didn't. Mm. She tapped him on the shoulder. <laughs> Might have hurt his little old head. She did not. She told him I wanted to ask him something, and he flew down to the ground. How did Rapunzel get to the ground? She didn't. She's still up in the tree. She is not. Well, then I don't know where she is. 
She's out in the kitchen right now making mustard fudge. She never tells me anything. Anyway, I told Billingsley I wanted to ask a favor of him. I explained about how Herman Haha was going to do some bird watching, but there weren't going to be any pretty or interesting birds around, and Billingsley said, You sure know how to hide a guy. But he understood what I meant, and would have accepted my apology if I had made one, and said he'd help if he could. I said, Billingsley, my wife Rapunzel has made up dozens of bird costumes that you can put on to fool Herman Haha into thinking he's seeing a whole bunch of different birds. I don't wish to appear crass, but uh, what's in it for me? A cookie fragment. Now you're talking. I don't come cheap, you know. Hey, you don't come what? Cheap, cheap. I'll say one thing. You have a way with chirps. <laughs> Eh, eh, well, Donnie, uh, Aunt Rapunzel made a little valise for Billingsley's costumes, and Billingsley learned how to imitate the various bird calls, and I coached Herman Haha on bird-watching techniques. Uh, okay, Herman, let's see if you got everything. Uh, you got the uh, hiking boots, uh, the drab clothes, uh, binoculars, uh, a reference book of the various birds you'll be seeing, uh, well, and a notebook to keep track of all the birds you'll see. Uh, that seems to cover everything. Except the salt. Salt? Yeah, salt. Uh, to put on a bird's tail if you want to study him up close. But what if I can't get up close? Then you carry this hard-boiled egg so the salt won't go to waste. And I'll need a camera so I can ask the birdie to watch the birdie. <laughs> so Herman was all set, and he started out on his first expedition. Billingsley, the sparrow, flew on ahead of him and changed into all of his various costumes. He had to work fast because Herman was a big man and took long strides. Before long, Poor Billingsley was exhausted. He climbed out of the robin costume he'd been wearing and tried to catch his breath. <laughs> Why, that's just an old sparrow. I won't even write down that I saw him. He's not important. And Herman walked on through the forest, leaving poor little Billingsley behind. As he went deeper and deeper into the forest, he became hopelessly lost. Uh. Oh, oh, I'm as lost as a bagel in a Chinese restaurant. But there was no one to laugh at his joke. And there was no laugh track. And night was coming on. Billingsley had been following him silently, rather annoyed at the snide way Herman had referred to his ordinariness. But as he got closer to Herman and saw the worried look on his face, he drew the words, follow me on a piece of bark, and holding it in his beak, he flew down so that Herman could see it. And did Herman see it? He did, and he said, Hmm, there's a little sparrow with a sign which offers me the option of following him. Uh, lead on, little sparrow. And I uh, wish to apologize for the unkind remark I made about you a while back. Of all the beautiful birds I saw today, uh, you're the only one who helped me. I'm putting your name on the top of my bird list. I'll just jot that down. The sparrow, a description, ugly, but well-meaning. That should do it. And I was out people watching today, and you're the only people I saw. So I will put you down on my list. I'll just say, one man. Description, fat. A plump. Fat. You think I'm fat? You are fat. And you're ugly. And you're still lost. I'll see you around. Wait, wait. Actually, um, you're beautiful. And you're right. I am fat. So Billingsley led Herman Haha out of the forest. And Herman invited his newfound sparrow friend to dinner and gave him birdseed stroganoff. And you know what Billingsley brought for dessert? Oh, sure. The cookie fragment. The cookie fragment. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
are listening to The Joe Bev Show, part three, the conclusion of Laurel and Hardy in For the Freedom of the World. Tell me, mother, I'm glad. I'm glad I did my bit for the freedom of the world. Fellows, the only thing I regret is that I won't be able to to be with you. Oh. When you go, when you go back to enjoy the gratitude of, of America, goodbye, fellows. May you drink to the full the rewards of a grateful nation. <sighs> he dies. The others regretfully leave him behind as they push on after the fleeing Huns. Enter an angel in the uniform of the YMCA. She goes up to the fallen hero and takes him in her arms tenderly and carries him off. Two years pass. The bedroom of a bachelor apartment in New York City in the fall of 1920. There is about the room an air of neglect, as though the occupant did not particularly give a damn whether he slept in this room or in hell. This is evidenced in a general way by the absence of any attempts at decoration, or by the presence of dirty laundry and unopened letters scattered about the room. The furniture consists of a bed and a bureau. At the foot of the former is a trunk, such as was used by American army officers in the recent war. Although it is three in the morning, the bed is unoccupied. The electric light over the bureau has been left lighted. The lamp flickers and goes out for a minute. When it flashes on, the angel, the angel and the former soldier are seen standing in the room as though they had come there directly from the close of the preceding war. The angel, however, has completely removed all YMCA insignia and now has a beard and chews tobacco. From time to time, he spits it out of the window. Ah, yes. Why the hell weren't you satisfied to stay in heaven? Well, I just wanted to see me old buddies once more. I wanted to see them enjoying the gratitude of the world. Well, then come with me behind this curtain, yes. Don't mind the rattling of the keys. It's only part of my act, yes. Then the light flashes on in the next room. The sound of unsteady steps. A vase is knocked over. A curse. And then the lieutenant. He wears a dinner coat, one sleeve of which hangs empty. His eyes set, his mouth hard and hopeless. He is drunk, not hilariously, but with the drunkenness of despair. He sits down on the bed and remains for several minutes, his head in his hands. God, I'm drunk. Drunk again. Well, well, what of it? Meh, what the hell difference does it make anyway? Get drunk if you want to. Why, sure I will. Get drunk. That's the dope. D-R-U-N-K, drunk. Oh, Christ. <clears throat> he throws himself on the bed, and after lying there a few minutes, sits up. I gotta have another drink. Can't go to sleep, God damn it, Brain. Brain too clear. Gotta kill brain. Kill brain. That's the dope. Kill brain. Forget. Uh, wipe out past. He opens the trunk and search for liquor. He suddenly pulls out his lieutenant's coat and holds it up. There's that goddamn thing. Never want to see it again. Wound stripes on right sleeve, too. Hurrah for the brave soldier. Arm shot off. Arm shot off to make the world safe for democracy. Blah. The goddamn hip- hypocrites. Democracy, hell. Arm shot off because I, I wasn't clever enough to stay out of it. No, ought to have had sense enough to, to join the, the, the ordinance department or, 
or the YMCA. He feels aimlessly through the pockets of his coat. Suddenly, from the inside breast pocket, he draws out something. A photograph. Ellen! Oh, God. He gazes at the picture for a long time. Yes, Ellen. Yes, Ellen, I should have joined the YMCA, shouldn't I? Yeah. Well, they don't get their arms shot off. Couldn't marry a man with one arm, could you? No. Couldn't marry old cock and knocker without one arm, could you? No, of course not. Think of looking at an empty sleeve year after year. Oh, our children might be born with one arm. Only one arm, too. Children. Oh, God damn you, Ellen. You and your, your YMCA husband. <sighs> He tears the picture in two and hurls it into the trunk. Then he sinks onto the bed, sobbing drunkenly. <laughs> After a few minutes, he walks over to the trunk and picks up one half of the torn picture. He turns it over in his hand and reads the writing on the back. I'm waiting for you, dear. When you have done your bit for the freedom of the world. He smiles wearily and reaches down to pick up the other half of the picture. His eye is caught by something shiny. It is his army revolver. He slowly picks it up and looks at it for a long time. For the freedom of the world. He quickly opens his top bureau drawer and takes out a box of cartridges. One of these he inserts in a chamber of his revolver. For the freedom! <laughs> he presses the revolver against his temple and fires. in a boarding house. To the left is a bed, to the right a grand piano, the latter curiously out of keeping with the other cheap furnishings. The room is in partial darkness. The door slowly swings open. The angel and the soldier enter. And here we have the room of your friend, the pawnbroker's son, yes. The musical prodigy, yes. The pianist, Par excellence, yes. Pianissimo, with a brilliant future indeed. They hide in a closet, leaving the door partially open. Enter former Private Laurel. He has a cutaway suit, a relic of his first and last public concert before the war. His shoulders sag dejectedly, and his face is drawn and white. He comes in and sits on the bed. A knock, a determined knock, is heard at the door, but Stanley does not move. The door opens, and his landlady, a shrewish, sharp-faced woman of forty, appears. He gets up off the bed when he sees her and bows. I forgot you were a little deaf, or I wouldn't have wasted my time hitting my knuckles against your door. Well... Well, Mr. Laurel, I guess you know why I'm here. It's pay up today or get out. Please write it down. You know I cannot hear a word you say. I'm a little bit deaf. I suppose it's about the rent. Today is the last day. If you can't pay, you must get out. What did you say? Oh, I, but I can't pay. Next week, perhaps, I shall get work. Yes, next week, maybe I'll have to sell another bond for $70, what I paid $100 for, too. No, sir, I need the money now. Here! Sell me piano? But please, I can't do that. N not yet. Oh, a lot of good a piano does a deaf person like you. 
That's a good one. Har, 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 de, har, har. The deaf musician. Hoo, hoo. With a piano yet. Madam, I shall pay you surely next week. There has been some delay in my war risk insurance payment. I should think you would trust a soldier who lost his hearing. I say you should think you would trust a soldier who lost his hearing in the trenches and is a little bit deaf. Oh, that's old stuff. What did you say? You soldiers think just because you were unlucky enough to get drafted, you can spend the rest of your live long life patting yourselves on the back and being on the dole. Besides, what good did the war do anyway, except make a lot of rich people rich and a lot of living people dead? Either you pay up tonight or out you go. She leaves with a flourish, slamming the door. Stanley sits on the bed for a long time. Finally, he glances at the wall over his bed where hangs a cheap photo frame. In the center is a picture of President Woodrow Wilson. On one side of this is a cruel print of a soldier. On the other side, a sailor. Above is the inscription, For the Freedom of the World. For the Freedom of the World. Stanley takes down the picture and looks at it. He sees hanging above it the bayonet which he had carried through the war. He slowly takes the weapon down, runs his fingers along the edge, and smiles. A quiet, tired smile, which does not leave his face during the rest of the scene. He walks over to the piano and plays the opening chords of a piano concerto. Then, scratching his head sadly, he tenderly closes the lid and locks it. He next writes a note, which he folds up and places with the key to the piano in an envelope. Sealing and addressing the envelope, he places it on the piano. Then, walking over to the bed, he picks up the bayonet and, shutting his eyes for an instant, he steps forward and cuts his throat. to the American street. A year later, after a year or more of peace, the arch across the thoroughfare still stands, although it has become badly discolored and dirty. The inscription for the freedom of the world is barely faintly visible. Workmen are busy at work, tearing down the arch. Ah, yes, yeah, stand over here, my boy, out of the way. And uh, you'll see the last of your cronies uh, over here. Yes, enjoying the gratitude of the world. He's wearing an old pair of corduroy trousers with his brown army shirt and shoes out at the heel. He looks as if he has not slept for days. Certainly he has not shaved for a week. He approaches one of the workmen. <laughs> Excuse me, kind sir. Is there perchance any opportunity for a job here? Hell no. There was 50 applicants yesterday. Most of them ex soldiers like you. Jobs is mighty scarce, pal. I'll say they are. I'd almost join the army again, except for my wife and children. God, don't do it! Don't do it, pal! I say, why not? Will you across? Yeah! God damn it! Eight months! Eight long months, pal! Next war, I'm letting somebody else do the fighting! As will I. The smart fellows were those who stayed home in the first place and kept their jobs. I'll say they were, pal. During this speech, the work on dismantling the arch is steadily progressed. Suddenly, there comes a warning cry. Look out! 
as the supports unexpectedly give way. Our former soldier is too engrossed in his tirade to take heed. And as the center portion of the arch falls, it crushes him beneath its weight. Ooh. After the cloud of dust clears, he is seen lying under the mass. By a curious twist of fate, he has been crushed by the portion of the arch bearing the inscription for the freedom of the world. His eyes open for an instant. He reads through the mist of approaching death the words for the freedom of the world. And he laughs. <laughs> His mocking laughter is interrupted by a severe fit of coughing and he sinks back dead. <laughs> oh my god, take me somewhere else, somewhere where I can't see the world. All right then, it's time to come to heaven. Oh, come to heaven. Come to heaven. Come to heaven for the freedom of the world. The end. This history was absolutely historical. Or is it hysterical? Hey, for the freedom of the world. That's a nice. For, 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 for the freedom of the world. G, for the freedom of the world. For the freedom of the world, yes. <laughs>